gentlemen, welcome to episode 72 of The Clutch Dump. My wife and brother-in-law just got home, so the dogs may be barking. However, welcome to the latest installment of The Clutch Dump. We've had some new listeners, some new fans be developed over the last few weeks, so welcome and thank you for becoming subscribers to The Clutch Dump. To subscribe, make sure to go find us on YouTube at The Clutch Dump Pod. And then if you want to follow us on our podcasting platforms, feel free. We are on Spotify, Sound, well, not SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pandora, Stitcher. Anywhere you listen, we are there. So make sure to check us out for the audio-only version if you are on a commute and you need something to listen to or you're doing yard work. Um, so that's always an option. And then leave a, late, a rating, excuse me, a rating and a review to let us know how we're doing and what you want to see more or less of. 20 years of trying, 20 years. And Senna sprints away. But Adam Frost. 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 He's right in behind Lorenzo. The 100 first. Indianapolis 500 is won by Takuma Sato. Dale Earnhardt will come to the caution flag to win the Daytona 500. Uh, this week is our, or this episode rather, is the first episode this week. It is our motorsports episode. And Ben, we have a lot to talk about, including scary, potentially life-ending accidents and... Someone who should have died in an accident but returned. Uh, we had a race in which Ferrari led, and more. Uh, we also had an IndyCar Much more. champion crowned. So, uh, yes. What would you like to start off with? What do you? Uh, what is suiting your fancy? What tickles your fancy? Well, the current thing tickling my fancy happens to be World Superbike, uh, which we didn't actually have a race this past weekend, but we do have news. A bunch of silly season news. Um. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the silliest season that World Superbike has ever had, and especially after the news that we got today, and that is that Jonathan Ray is leaving KRT Kawasaki after nine years and six championships with them. Um, Unreal. This new, um, I didn't see this coming. Apparently some people in the World Superbike community did. I don't know. I'm not super into the World Superbike community. I do follow a lot, but I'm not like in depth with right. the community and the, I really just follow the racing. Um, so I was quite shocked because kind of the only thing that Kawasaki is known for, for me is, is Jonathan, Jonathan Ray. Ray. Like that's kind of it. Um, uh, I think this is probably for non world Superbike fans, but maybe you're familiar with MotoGP. This is kind of like when Rossi said he was retiring, but like if Rossi said he's leaving and is going to Honda, that kind of thing, like it's like, yeah, but you, you're the best ever with these guys right. and those guys aren't winning. So why are you going there? Anyway, um, it's called so he's the leaving. end of a career. <laughs> so he is, well, maybe not because he's leaving KRT Kawasaki um, and he will be riding alongside Andrea Locatelli at Pata Yamaha, um, replacing Top Rack Razgat Leoglu. No, um, not Top Rack. Because if you remember several episodes ago, or if you didn't, Top Rack Razgat Leoglu is leaving Yamaha after his very successful career with them, and he is going to BMW. That career move actually makes no sense. Um, Yamaha has well, actually done pretty good named, this year. Top Top Rack has won it? some races for Yamaha, whereas BMW has won nothing. So well, when quite you an interesting name move. With, like alphabet soup. I don't expect the wisest career choices. True. Um, so best of luck to Jonathan Ray, who has signed, as of now, a two-year contract through 2025 with Yamaha. So hopefully best of luck to him. Uh, today, a very heartwarming Instagram post was put out by one Michael Ruben Ronaldi, who is the second writer on the Aruba IT Ducati uh, World Superbike team, which is the factory team, for those of you that don't know. Um, and he will end his... Uh, end his contract with them at the end of the 2023 season. Uh, he is leaving. We have no word on where he's going yet. Uh, however, he did end his Instagram post with see you on the track Ducati. So presumably he will, he does have a seat. I'm assuming he's finishing up a contract there. Um, so best of luck to Michael Ruben Rinaldi, wherever he goes, uh, in other news, uh, Nicolo Bulija, I'm assuming I pronounced that right. I'll have to get used we'll to that one. Him. We'll go with um, it. Um, will be writing for Aruba IT Ducati. He is taking 
Michael Rinaldi's seat. He'll be riding alongside Alvaro Batista starting in 2024. I do not know how long his contract is. I believe it's only one year, maybe two years. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Nicolo, he is the 2015 FIM uh, Moto3 Junior World Champion. Um, some other names that were in that series at the time was some guy named Juan Mir and another guy named Marco Bezzecchi. So uh, Nicola has some chops, and he's currently leading the 2023 World Super Sport Championship, uh, which is the class below Super Bike. Um, still 1,000cc bikes, but a bit more turned down. Um, and he's currently leading with Ducati, so he gets the step up to the big boy bike on the factory team. And then some news that if you are an older MotoGP fan, not actually much older, but 2019 at least, um, <laughs> that'd be you and me. Uh, Andrea Iannone will join a satellite Ducati World Superbike team as, starting in the 2024 20, season. As my dad always called him, because of all the, how the Italian commentators would say his name, my dad would always go, Andrea Iannone. Yes, for Steve, who's not listening, that one's for you. <laughs> um, so if you don't know who Andrea Yanone is, uh, we won't make a super big bit about it, but he was in MotoGP for a long time, like 2015, uh, no, 2008. He was, he was like the original Italian Rossi era parent behind Marco Simoncelli. Yeah. He, so he was, he was, I want to say like 14 through 18, maybe? Uh, 2019 was when he had his issues. Okay, so it was 2014 through 2019 then? Because he I, was I couldn't remember if it was 2014 or 2015. Italy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he came in, he rode for several different companies, or manufacturers, I should say. What and, the hell? What sorry. the fuck? What? <laughs> Um, I'm, so, I'm, it's been a long day. <laughs> Please excuse me. Uh, having some brain farts today. But uh, Andrea rode for Aprilia in 2019, where uh, there was a drug test where he was found guilty of using ster was found guilty of using steroids. Oh, uh, got, a, got an 18 month band, then tried to fight it, and they found Dude, more evidence, is, and actually is, this, it became a four year band. The here's the thing. He's just trying to make MotoGP badass. Like, if you got a bunch all of roided, some hey, roided Europeans on bikes, like... You know, it's not his fault that the rest of the grid wasn't trying as hard as he was. So exactly, that's all. exactly. If you're not <laughs> hard enough if you're not cheating. Uh, anyway, that's super cool, because uh, I think I only got to watch Andrea Iannone race for two or three years um, when I started following MotoGP. So it'll be super cool to see him back on oh, a bike sure. one, once his ban is over. They haven't said which satellite Ducati team. I think there's two or three in world superbike so should be interesting to see who leaves who doesn't uh but it's always fun uh this is the biggest silly season we've had for world superbike so that should be quite interesting uh mr patty now that i've had my little spiel where would you like to take this I podcast some news bits that are not i like th there's a piece of news for each kind of series but i'm just gonna run through the news so that it doesn't get intermixed with the results if that's cool with you by all means please okay so MotoGP news Okay. Marco Bezzecchi re-signed with VR46 Moody Racing. We did not... That's happened, and we haven't covered it on our Motorsport episode. Um, so, for all of you Bezzecchi fans and VR46 team fans, another crazy-haired Italian is staying with the team, so that is good news. Perfect. Um, he signed through 2024. 2025, we don't know. Uh, Scott McLaughlin, the IndyCar and former V8 Supercar driver, is rejoining Tower Motorsports for Motul Petit Le Mans, the LMP2 car. Uh, Linus Lundquist signed a multi-year agreement to drive for Chip Ganassi in IndyCar beginning in 2024. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? We have uh, Formula One, blah, blah, blah. Scott Dixon making some comments. We have some NASCAR yep. results. Let me keep scrolling because... Because we had some NASCAR drama, maybe. Uh, here maybe it is. He's, got, he's got it. Felix Rosenquist has signed a multi-year agreement joining Meyer Shank Racing starting in 2024. So, uh, if you're not familiar, Felix Rosenquist was a young, uh, super sweet driver that signed with McLaren a couple of years back, and I believe it's he's been there for three years. Uh, now he's moving to Meyer Shank. That was heavily speculated this last weekend at Portland, but it's been confirmed. F1 news, it has been confirmed that by the FIA that all 10 Formula 1 teams complied with the cost cap regulations for 2022, so no teams are getting penalties for cost cap uh, potential issues. So which team do you think paid off the FIA? Uh, uh, today, 
hot off the motorsport skillet, Andretti Autosport no longer exists. It is now it, Andretti Global. Andretti Global, and it has been leaked that the FIA is announcing Andretti Global is allowed to get an F1 entry. However, Liberty Media still has to approve. Yes. So, for once, I am going to praise the French and say it's not their fault if Americans don't come in and open up a can of whoop-ass on the rest of the Formula 1 field. And by Americans, yes. that's real Americans, not a Haas that has a Ferrari engine run by an Austrian. N none of that crap. I mean, cattle right. and ready as as gabagool Italian as it gets and American. Right. It's our own fault if it happens. Yes, exactly. It's it's which I was telling my boss today. If you don't know my okay. boss, Tim Wolfkill, pretty cool guy. But I was talking to him and I was like, you know, it, it it would make no sense because Liberty is an American company. Wouldn't they want more Americans? And he goes, at the end of the day, it's all about money. They don't give a shit if you're American or if you're and I'm just like Absolutely. What a sad state of affairs. But, Almost as if businesses work like businesses. Okay. Uh, it's a shame. So that I believe, yeah, that's all of my Twitter motorsports news. Um, I, I, I need to come up with a little cute segment name for all the Twitter news that I get uh, for motorsports, but I'll, that, that, that's one that's one for a, a, another time. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the at a, at a high level. Oh, also, Denny Hamlin extended uh, his contract with Joe Gibbs Racing and FedEx uh, and NASCAR. Um, I think that's it. Uh, that was fantastic day, I think. So, um, let's what see. Do you want to get into next? I say NASCAR. Let's do it. So, this last weekend was the first round of the playoffs at Darlington, the Southern Cookout 500. And let me tell you something. I had some Southern cooking this weekend because my wife and I went to Cracker Barrel twice, and it was busting. So, I have I have some knowledge when it comes to Southern Cookout. Uh, sure. But Darlington happened this weekend, and if you're not familiar, listen, this is the first time I've actually watched the entire Southern 500 at Darlington, uh, because one, I just haven't cared, uh, but two, sure. I've also figured out how to get around, having to have cable TV, and have access to watching it. So, I didn't know this, but Darlington was the first super speedway in NASCAR, which, <laughs> if you were to look at it, you'd be like, that's not a super speedway, that's like a short I'm track. It was in the 1960s, probably. Uh, 1950s. So, yeah, it was like Terrifying. 1951 or something. Um, Jesus. It was the first super speedway. But Darlington is such an interesting track to watch. And granted, guys, I'm talking shades of gray, right? Like, ovals, right. the best oval is not as good as a, good, as a bad road course. However, exactly. for the oval racing that I've watched this season, Darlington had a lot to offer because it's the track where they literally... The, to run it the fastest, every lap, you have to have the rear corner skidding across the wall. Perfect. The front right not touching. Like, it is such a cool Perfect. balancing act. Um, so, super entertaining race. Granted, it's a 500-mile race. So, it's a lot. Takes a while. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at, like, three hours. Um, yeah. And there was a red flag period because they couldn't get the lights to work. And it happens. Because Darlington is so important to run up against the wall. When you didn't have the lights on the inside of the track working, literally the three feet up to the wall were pitch black. So drivers right. were like, I don't know where the wall is. <laughs> I don't know is. where like, I am. <laughs> yeah, like I, I get into the dark and then it's all dark and there's a wall somewhere, but I can't see it. Um, so You'll it find it eventually. A red flag. But it was the first round of the playoffs. It was a, a good race. Kevin Harvick had a shot to win. And then because Tyler Reddick is a jackass, it, it didn't happen. Happens. So before I get to the results, we had I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight two little drama bits during the race. Um, so this is a little bit more detail than we normally get on the NASCAR races, but I'm not gonna go into the kind of lap by lap. Here's what happened. Um, sure. So there were kind of two instances of of idiocy. The first being Kevin Harvick was coming into the pits to undercut Tyler Reddick, and okay. he was going to be beautiful because kevin harvey mm -hmm. last season in nascar his last playoffs his last chance to win a championship his nickname is the closer and we're in the final stage of the race kevin harvick duck, ducks early to come into the pits right mm -hmm. tyler reddick is in the lead ahead of kevin harvick by about a second um and so on an oval he's he's just kind of out of sight out of the mirror mm -hmm. tyler reddick way later than you normally would ever consider coming to the pits 
is like checking his mirror, checking his mirror, checking his mirror. He notices Kevin Harvick's coming into the pits. And so he lifts way out of the throttle on the racing line to try to come into the pits. Sketchy. Well, behind him is Ryan Newman going full bore, full beans. Because racing line. On the racing line. Ryan Newman sees that Tyler Reddick is, is way out of the throttle, guys. Remember, NASCARs have no brake light, so it's not like you could see it from a distance. You have to notice right. it due to the closing rate. So by the time he realizes it, he gets all the way out of the throttle. What happens when you get all the way out of the throttle in a heavy NASCAR? The rear just completely Whee! steps down. Now, here's the thing. Yep. NASCAR, when a car starts spinning up on the banking, immediately full course yellows because they don't know what's going to happen or, or where it's going to end up. So to try to get everybody to slow down the yellow so that you don't have people at full speed trying to weave in and out and avoid. Right. Kevin Harvick was a half car length behind the pit entry line. Mm. And Ryan Newman spun, which caused the full coast yellow, which means pit lane closed, which means Kevin Harvick got a full penalty. And and if you're wondering what the penalty is, it's you drop like a rock to the back of the field. No contest. That hit, sucks. Nothing. You drop all the way to the back of the field. Now, here's what sucks about it. No one disagrees that it's Tyler Reddick's fault. Because, first of all, you're at the point of no return, right? It's like when you're, for, for our fans that maybe don't have track experience or don't watch racing a lot, it's like when you're on the road and the light goes yellow and you're at that point of, I have to immediately slam on the brakes, but if you hesitate at all, you just got to go through. You just got to right to going through the light, right? So it's like that where if you wait too long and then you try to slam on the brakes, you're going to end up in the middle of the intersection. You're not going to make it. Right. So it was completely Tyler Reddick's fault, but what sucks about this is it's not just that Ryan Newman spun. It's that it coincidentally, not intentionally, but coincidentally eliminated Tyler Reddick's largest competitor from contention and put him at the back of the field mm. in the Darlington race. So I was, because I was sitting there, I was like, Kevin Harvick has a chance to win this. Like, this would right. be great. It would be a Cinderella story. I had people tweeting on Twitter about, oh, yo, Kevin Harvick could win this. And then Tyler Reddick, because he's playing a game of chicken, driving out of his mirror, makes a, makes a stupid move, ruins Kevin Harvick's race. So that was upsetting. Everybody agreed Tyler Reddick was at fault. So Tyler Reddick, get your shit together. Yep. All right. So that was incident number one. Incident number two, and I'll be a little bit quicker. Um, coming down the back straight into turn three, Alex Bowman, with less than 50 laps left, threw a block all the way to the low line on Daniel Suarez. Daniel Suarez immediately, and almost in F1 style, where it's a real sharp cut, goes all the way right. And Alex Bowman tries to, in reaction, go all the way right. And what happens is, so imagine this is the outside of the track, guys, right? And if you're if you're on audio, check us out on YouTube if, if you want more explanation or look up the clip right. on YouTube or Twitter. So they're like this. Alex Bowman goes all the way to the inside to cover off Daniel Suarez. Daniel Suarez cuts back right. Alex Bowman goes to cut back. But then when Daniel Suarez is straight and Alex Bowman continues to move right, you have the front to rear contact, and it turned Alex Bowman into the wall. Daniel Suarez is like, listen, when you're driving Alex Bowman, he's going to do stupid stuff. He threw a block to the inside. He threw a block to the outside. I, I, I didn't hit him. I didn't take him out. I just didn't lift, right? Right. Alex Bowman in his, like, listen, when you have a voice like Alex Bowman, I'm just going to write you off completely anyway. Because he's like, yeah, I mean, when when I was when I was trying to blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, dude, like, yeah, I just don't want to listen to you anyway. But Alex Bowman was like, oh, well, you know, Daniel's always a dirty racer like that. And, you know, even his, his crew chief flipped me off when I saw him at the airport, blah, blah, blah. And Daniel Suarez is, I think it's Cliff Daniels, his crew chief, literally tweeted he's like when the hell did i flip you off like I, I, what are you talking about so alex bowman's just making up bullshit to make his story seem more believable and to make himself seem like somehow he's the victim and he got taken out when alex bowman was just driving like an idiot and dale earnhardt jr was calling alex bowman out and saying dude listen you got a lot more race to, to run you could have easily gotten the position back you ended up ruining your race because you were trying to be too defensive with too much time left in the race. So, anyway, those are the two little drama bits uh, during the race. Obviously, for those of y'all that watched the race, there was more that went on. But for those of y'all that watched it, you already know what happened. So, um, let me run through the results real quick. And I mean it. I'm going to do it real quick. 
In 36th, we had B.J. McLeod. In 35th, Harrison Burton. 34th, Daniel Suarez. 33rd, Alex Bowman. 32nd, Michael McDowell. 31st, Austin Sindrick. 30th, J.J. Yaley. 29th, Ty Dillon. 28th, Ryan Priest. 27th, Ryan Newman. 26th, Todd Gillen. 25th, Denny Hamlin. 24th, Justin Haley. 23rd, Christopher Bell. 22nd, Corey LaJoy. 21st, Ty Gibbs. 20th, Austin Dillon. 19th, Kevin Harvick. Uh, 18th is Martin Truex Jr. 17th is Carson Hosevar who is filling in in the number 42 uh, Legacy Motor Club car. He's a truck series regular. 16th, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., 15th, Chase Briscoe, 14th, Eric Almarola, 13th, A.J. Almendinger, 12th, Joey Logano, 11th, Kyle Busch, 10th, Eric Jones, 9th, Ryan Blaney, 8th, Chase Elliott, 7th, Bubba Wallace, 6th, Brad Keselowski, 5th, Ross Chastain, 4th, William Byron, 3rd, Chris Buescher, 2nd, Tyler Reddick, and 1st place is Kyler, Kyle excuse me, Larson, uh, rounding out your field for the Southern 500. That's it. <laughs> you actually ran through that very quickly. <laughs> um, I spent a little bit more time than I wanted talking about the, the drama bits. So. <clears throat> That's perfectly okay. Um, I say we go to... I kind of want to finish with MotoGP and Formula One. So let's, do so let's go to IndyCar next. You watch the race. I absolutely did not watch the race. You missed out, dude. I've never watched a race around Portland. That is one of my favorite tracks in the country now. It looked super good, but I was I was doing stuff and I just okay. wasn't well, able to works. watch it. So I'll uh, I'll I'll cover IndyCar real quick and then we can Please. hop on to uh F two and stuff that I don't know why you'd cover. Uh, so IndyCar, um, and also guys, I forgot to watch Super Cup this weekend because I got really busy. I'm sorry. So happens. IndyCar highlights is Alex Pillow wins. Hi, Watson. You're so cute. Alex Pillow wins his fifth IndyCar race of the year, clinching his second IndyCar title. The first time since 2007 that there has been an IndyCar championship decided before the final race. Hear that, F1 fans? It's actually rare in IndyCar. Come check it out. Um, Andretti Autosport, we mentioned. Felix Rosenquist, we mentioned. Uh, he will drive aside, uh, drive alongside Tom Blomquist in the MSR team. Uh, they will be running a third car in the Indy 500 with Helio Castroneves uh, running that car. Um, we have one race left in IndyCar, and it is the Firestone Grand Prix of Monterey, and that is happening September 10th. Um, so make sure if you have not watched any IndyCar this season, make sure to watch that. You know why? Because nobody's going to have anything left to play for or, or hold on to when it comes to championship. It's going to be an all-out brawl for the uh, race win. So let me run through your results. In 27th, we had Roman Grosjean. 26th, Augustin Canapino. 25th, Will Power. 24th, Tom Blomquist. 23rd, Stingray Rob. 22nd, Benjamin Pedersen. 21st, Alex, or excuse me, Ryan hunter Ray. Then in 20th, we have Alexander Rossi. 19th, Marcus Armstrong. 18th, Yuri Vips. For F1 fans, that is the Red Bull Academy driver, or was. 17th, Devlin, Fre Devlin D. Francesco. 16th, Santino Ferrucci. 15th, Callum Eilat. 14th, Helio Castroneves. 13th, Colton Herta. 12th, your pole sitter, Graham Rahal. 11th, Christian Lungard. 10th, Kyle Kirkwood. 9th, Scott McLaughlin. 8th, David Malukas. 7th, Marcus Erickson. I have no idea who uh, some Van Calm Flaw is in sixth. Joseph Newgarden in fifth. Uh, <laughs> fourth is Patricio Award. Third is your runner-up in the championship, Scott Dixon. Second, Felix Rosenquist. And first place is Alex Pillow. All Alex Pillow had to do this race was finish on the podium, and he clenched the championship. And he decided to just go on and win the damn thing. Not enough. Must win. So, yeah, exactly. We had some crazy kind of highlights during this race, including a very controversial block that Alex Pillow threw, I believe, into turn four. Um, and I'm going to be honest. All the commentators, myself and others, all think Alex Pillow should have been penalized for it, in which case he would not have clenched the championship this weekend. Um, and so IndyCar has kind of gotten themselves into, hot, some hot, into some hot water. IndyCar got themselves into hot water, furthermore, because... They've been throwing some pretty subjective yellow flags, i.e. this weekend, they waited to throw a yellow flag until the leader could come in and pit. And then once the leader pulled out of pit lane, then IndyCar threw the yellow. Keep in mind, the car that Strange. had caught the spin in a high-speed area of the track 
in the line of fire where if a car, let's say it's a right-hand turn, let's say you lose control going into turn in, you would have collided with the car because it was on the outside of the track. Um, uh, IndyCar, let that car sit there for over a half lap. Mm, little, Waited until little suspect the that one. In. Yeah, so IndyCar's mm. under fire. Granted, guys, don't shit yourselves. It's not Abu Dhabi 2021. But it's just kind of like... Yeah, he had a pretty NASCAR substantial lead, so... Similar to NASCAR, where it's like, hey, NASCAR, maybe don't throw the yellow all the time. And then when NASCAR doesn't throw the yellow right. all the time, it's like, well, now NASCAR's not throwing the yellow all the time. <laughs> Why didn't you throw the... Yeah, it's... Yeah. So, um, yeah, drama. But at the end of the day, no one... Even if Alex Pelot didn't clinch it this race, he would have next race. And even if he didn't next race, he realistically deserves to be the champion anyway. Um, so... Right. There you go. That's IndyCar. I think that's everything, right, for IndyCar? That is indeed everything for IndyCar because you ran through all of my news bits earlier, so that covers all of that. Congratulations, before, Alex Below. It's not IndyCar, but before we move on, we do have this weekend World Endurance Championship at Fuji. Yes, so, going to be very exciting. Must yeah. watch. Yes, we will be covering that on our next Motorsport episode, but now we shift gears towards Formula 2, Formula 1, uh, and no. MotoGP. We are shifting gears off the notes page, Mr. Patty. We're going rogue off the notes page um, because I threw something on there last minute because I wanted to cover it just because you might find a tad bit of it interesting. Uh, so this past weekend was World Time Attack Challenge at Sydney Motorsports Park. A Porsche 1 relax, okay? Um, Can you say it for the audience in the back? A transaxle Porsche 1. Okay. Taking now, the technology that the 944 started, throwing it all away and making something that looks like a 968 go really fast. Um, anyway, World Time Attack Challenge was back, um, and it was this past week, and it was very exciting because it's the first time that actually the world got to participate in the past few years because there was something going around called COVID, I think. Something uh, like so. That. Something like that. So people didn't get to participate, but it was very exciting because World Time Attack invited a bunch of people from different countries in, and it was super cool. And in the Pro-Am class, uh, we had one Ferris Kartumi, which, if you remember when I covered Super Light Battle at Circuit of the Americas, I talked about Ferris Kartumi. Yep. He's got a twin-turbo C6 Corvette, fastest time attack car in the United States. He went over first time a World Time Attack challenge and ran in the Pro-Am class, and he won his first time in the Pro-Am class. So congratulations to him. He won with a time of, what was it, 127.016, um... Which is incredibly fast, by the way. Something else that runs a 127, um, just for reference, is a Audi R8 GT3 Evo 2. Um, in case you're wondering how fast that car is, um, it has a significantly less advanced uh, aero package than that R8, as well as that R8 being mostly a tube chassis. Um, yeah. So incredibly well done to Ferris Kartumi. However, the thing that we do need to talk about is one Barton Maurer in a car called the RP968. Now, this car is famous for being the world's fastest time attack car. Um, so it decided to continue that reputation and break its own lap record by two and a half seconds. Has it gone around um, the Norch Lifo? This year, it ran... What's up? Has it gone around the Norch Lifo? I don't think it has any track records other than this one. I think it's genuinely just designed to do this. I want it um, to do the Norch Lifer. I don't, I don't know that it could survive a whole lap of the Norch Lifer. It's not designed to run for that long. Like, it's designed to work for three laps of Sydney Motorsport Park. Um, it's a time attack car. They're designed to do that. Um, time so the attack, RP 968, if you're not familiar with it, it's Lifer. a... Just time attack one lap around the Norch life and get over yourselves. Come on. Well, okay, you could. Anyway, they should, though, because that'd be super cool. Um, and I'm genuinely curious how this car would do at other tracks like, I don't know, Coda. Um, but for those of you that are unfamiliar with this car, it somewhat looks like a 968. It's a full tube chassis. It's a full carbon body. Um, it has a billet motor that the architecture somewhat resembles resembles a 968 hey, motor. We'll take it. Um, it resembles it a has, more than it resembles anything else. <laughs> um, it's got a sequential from a V8 supercar. It's got a billet torque tube. Uh, it's powder shift sequential. Ben, um, ben, the gun. You, you, you gotta stop the dirty talk, dude. <laughs> the, Let me excuse myself. 
um, the guy that designed the air package for it worked for a company. I, I think it's called Williams. Um, oh. So in case you're wondering, um, Ferris Khartoumi went over there and a bunch of silly Americans on the internet were like, oh, Ferris Khartoumi is going to go over there and murder the track record because he's got 28 track records in the United States, which for starters, incredibly impressive. 28 track records in yeah. a car that you built yourself. Crazy impressive. But he went over there. And he did a video with World Time Attack, and he goes, I'm not going to break the record. My car is a joke compared to these cars. He's like, my car's never been in a wind tunnel. He's like, it could be the worst aero package ever. He's like, I don't have traction control. I don't have ABS. He's like, yeah. I don't even, he's like, I don't even have data logging for half the stuff on this car. I just threw more power at it and more tire, and it went faster. Um, so the 968 was 10 seconds faster than Ferris Khartoumi. Um, it, it was... Get it was which by the way there was an interview with the person who built the 968 and they asked how much of this is a porsche and he said the only thing that would fit on a 968 is the badge well same thing for the c6 though see that's the thing that i love is no that c6 corvette is a c6 corvette chassis it's a corvette that's the difference is we aren't at that level yet that's a tube chassis and they're replacing parts this is a Corvette, and he's using off-the-shelf parts. It's yeah, got a crate all, engine all in it. It's body work. It's Kevlar. Anyway. Um, yeah, but, okay, off-the-shelf my ass. They're off-the-shelf. You can buy them. I'll send you the link right now. <laughs> you can buy them. All the parts are off-the-shelf. There's no one-off parts except for, like, custom intercooler piping, which is fine. Oh, yeah, I mean. I could build that. That's not crazy. Anyway. The RP968, for those of you wondering how fast it yeah, is. Ben's like, Ben's like, I could build that. That's not crazy. Like the three quarter of a million dollar muscle cars I build. Those aren't crazy. I don't think they're crazy. I'm kind of bored of them. Anyway, the 968, the RP968, is five seconds a lap faster than a Formula 3 car around this track. It's 10 seconds a lap faster than an R8 uh, LMS Evo 2. Mm -hmm. And it is, what am I looking at here? 13 seconds a lap faster than a 991.2 GT3 Cup car. Um, that That's is a... Insane. That is a stupid fast car. Um, this is the first time they ever ran it on slicks, so hopefully we can see the car go even faster. I think their goal... I think their... Stupid fast 968, yeah. I think their goal for the weekend was to run a 119-something, and they did a 117.8, so substantially surpassed it. Um, I wish I prepared a bit more for this. I kind of forgot that it happened. Well, that's um, okay. Because... It's only a car. We could have talked about it on the car episode, so I think you're doing fine. Well, I really wanted to cover World Time Attack because there are a bunch of other classes, and there was a Honda Swap Lotus Elise that did really well, and it was fantastic. Um, oh, that... You do know that Lotuses have Toyota motors, right? Yes. Okay. Toyota it makes like much better than Honda. It is not by any means. It makes Guys, like drop drop in the comments below which is yes. better, Toyota or Honda. And if you say Honda, you are wrong. The or coolest like car Honda fast. makes is NSX doesn't really count. The Supra or not? The Supra. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the, no, the you don't even R, know what Honda makes, and you're excluding R, the fact that they the, built a Supra. Listen. Listen, the Type R, but Toyota got the Supra? Come on. It's a good-looking Z4. I'll give them that. Yeah, and the Honda's a good-looking recycled family hatch. It's real. It's a hot hatch. That's its purpose. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's going to be a real time attack because, because I didn't prepare for everything. But we are going to move on to uh, MotoGP. Mr. Patty, did you watch MotoGP at Catalonia? So, I, I meant to. Okay. Um, also, can well, we skip it, Formula 2? Because quite frankly, who cares? I care. It's my podcast. It's how this works. Anyway, um, so MotoGP, we were at Catalonia this past weekend, which was a fantastic race. Um, I'm going to skip through. Like Naya getting his leg shattered. Uh, not shattered. Totally fine. Um, which really? makes n no sense. I saw a video. He walked out of the hospital. Dude's an absolute trooper. He's fine. So he's not out for any races? Uh, he said he's going to try to be back for night for starters walked out with crutches to be fair. He's not totally fine, but then his legs are in one piece. Um, which is insanely, which is more than can be said for his teammate who is very broken. Um, despite having a much less dramatic crash, which we'll get to in a second. Um, wow. 
So uh, this past weekend, we had the Catalonia Grand Prix, and I'm going to go through the sprint results real quick. Paul Espargaro DNF'd, so he was 22nd. Juan Mir, 21st. Takanakagami, 20th. Iker Likawona was in 19th. Fabio Quattararo down in 18th, not doing super well on that Yamaha. Augusto Fernandez was 17th. Jack Miller down in 16th, not having a good weekend. Franco Morbidelli, 15th. Earl Fernandez in 14th. Fabio De Gina Antonio in 13th, Luca Marini down in 12th, Mark Marquez in 11th, his brother Alex Marquez in 10th, Anaya Bastianini was 9th in the sprint, Marco Bezzecchi 8th, John Zarco 7th, Miguel Oliveira was in 6th, Jorge Martin 5th, Brad Binder 4th, Maverick Vinales 3rd, Peko Bagnaia 2nd, and Alicia Spargaro clinching the Tiso sprint win at his home Grand Prix, which was very exciting. Which now moving on. How on fire alicia has been? He has been doing fantastic as of recently. Um, it appears that the only bikes that can take it to Ducati are the Aprilias and the KTMs. It appears that the Japanese bikes just can't touch them. Um, the Hondas and the Yamahas are Sorry, just saying hello, nowhere. Everybody. Say oh, hi. hello, Watson. Everyone say hi to Watson. Um, so, yeah, both of the Aprilia actually... the. Most of the Aprilias were fantastic this weekend. Uh, Miguel Oliveira included did fantastic this weekend, uh, like we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but the Aprilia is doing fantastic. Sadly, nowhere close enough to win the championship, but doing super well. Um, so I'll be holding out for them in the future to hopefully win a championship. Uh, moving on to the race, it, we had a very exciting opening lap. Yeah, uh, One of the most dramatic opening laps of a MotoGP race in a very long time. Um, so lap one, turn one, incident involving Enea Bastianini, Joan Zarco, Alex Marquez, Fabio Di Antonio, and Marco Bezzecchi. Now, Enea Bastianini initiated that accident, basically turn one into Catalonia. is like turn one into any other racetrack. It's high speed straight, slow speed corner. Um, it's a slow speed right-hander, and basically he decided to be last of the late breakers once again, which to be fair, someone's going to do it, so it might as well be him. Um, he went into it and front brake locked up, bike might went well be down. The guy, might as well be the guy that just renewed his contract. <laughs> just renewed his contract. Um, so bike went down, he low-sided going into Joan Zarco, and then Alex Marquez, Dijan Antonio, and Bezeki. Now, um, of those, the people that rejoined were, in fact, um, all of them, except for Ine Bastianini. Um, so, uh, they all managed to get their bikes back up. And basically what happens is when there's an accident and they red flag the race, which we'll get to in a second, why they red flagged it. When they red flag a session, if your bike went down, you have, I think it's like five minutes or something to get yourself on your bike right. back to the pits. If you do so, you can swap to your backup bike and you can rejoin the race. If your bike is unable to make it back, you are deemed out of the race. Um, so all of them, except for an A, Bashanini, and e, were able to make it back to the race because Bashanini e suffered a fracture in his hand and his ankle. Um, he will miss at least the San Marino, the Indian, and the Japanese Grand Prix. That's the next three Grand Prix. Those leaving. are such good races. Which really sucks, because those are usually really good. Uh, which leaves only six Grand Prix at the end for him to participate. And for those of you that do not follow MotoGP, uh, Bastianini missed the first five races after suffering a broken shoulder blade during the opening sprint race of the season. Oh. Didn't even make it to Grand Prix number one. That sounds um, miserable. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad about the Enea Bastianini accidents. Now, granted, this one kind of self-inflicted. Um, but can but, you blame him? I mean, it's going to happen. Um, the thing that really sucks for me, though, is Bastianini came super close to winning the championship last year on a satellite bike. Right, so right, right. He was who I was rooting for this year to take the championship from Peko, given that he was close on a year-old bike, and now that they're right. on equal machinery, I assumed that he would take it to Peko. But he had that accident, not his fault, at the beginning of the season, took him out for five races, basically not possible for him to win. And especially now that he's going to miss at least three more, if not more than that. Right. Um, so that really sucks for Nea Bastianini, but the drama did not end at turn one because lap one, turn two, there was an incident involving Peko Benyaya and him only um, suffering a massive high side. Basically yep. what he said was there was cold tires um, and basically coming out of turn two, which is a left-hander bike stepped out right. Um, or yeah, the tail end went right. He went over the bike, went flying through the air, an entire pack of riders behind him trying to catch him. Um, and he actually ended up being hit by Brad Bender um, as he slid across the track. Terrifying accident to watch. It, I mean, like, stomach was in my throat. It was 
horrible to watch. Yeah. Um, thankfully, he's okay. He has no fractures. Um, That's you know, so, apparently like, it. it... It baffles me, and it makes me so upset knowing that Simoncelli could have been that lucky. Yeah, um, and that's kind of the things that were going through my head when I was watching this happen. Um, super terrifying accident. Uh, Brad Bender, there was, honestly, if you watch the replay, nothing he could have done. Um, I mean, um, We gotta so... remember, for people watching and listening, on a bike, it's much more difficult to turn, because not only do you have to turn, you have to lean. Right. Uh, and, so it's especially if you're going that fast and you're yeah, coming out of a left hander, you, know, you, you have to jump right. It doesn't it doesn't work like that. Um, however, um, good on Brad Bender, because as soon as the race was over, he went straight to the medical center, checked on Pekka Benyai, apologized, yeah. all those things. They're on good terms. Um, so well on Brad Bender. But Pekka Benyai uh, suffered, suffered several contusions, but no fractures and was able to travel back home with the team Sunday night. He does not need any surgeries or anything. Um, the reigning world champion is aiming to be back on the bike at next week's San Marino Grand Prix. That would be super exciting. I don't think anyone's expecting anything crazy out of him. Um, but that was a very scary accident. Um, and something to note is after this weekend's results, Hori Martin is only 50 points behind Pekko Banyaya. Now, there's nine races left. So there's a lot of points on the table, um, considering that there's 36 points a weekend available. So missing a Grand Prix, if he's not up to par for next yeah. weekend, could be a serious, uh, serious a issue Martin championship. for uh, Pekko's championship lead. Especially if we get to next weekend and both of the factory riders are out, yeah. and Jorge Martin, who was supposed to get the factory seat before Ine right. Bastianini had a right. stellar season, got... Uh, you know, got a, or didn't get that seat. Right. So he's still in the Premac uh, bike, but I'm going to go through your race results. So Pekka Vignay, Ine Bashanini, DNF, along with Paul Spargo, Brad Bender, and Raul Fernandez. So Brad Bender, um, after that, we'll call it incident with Pekka Vignay, uh, did not continue on. He had an issue with the bike. Um, so those five DNF. Juan Mir finished last in 17th. Eko Lekawona finished in 16th. Takanakagami, 15th. Franco Morbidelli, 14th. Mark Marquez down in 13th. Marco Bezzecchi was 12th. Luca Marini was 11th. Fabio De Gian Antonio was 10th. Augusto Fernandez was 9th. Jack Miller was 8th. Fabio Quattararo was 7th. Alex Marquez was up in 6th. Miguel Oliveira on the satellite Kate, sorry, satellite Aprilia was up in 5th, Jean Zarco on the Pramac in 4th, Jorge Martin on the other Pramac, whom we just mentioned, was up in 3rd, and you had an all-Spanish podium at the Spanish Grand Prix of Jorge Martin, Maverick Vinales in 2nd, and Alicia Spargaro in 1st. Super cool, all of those guys are good buddies, it's so it was fun to see. one too, right? Um, I think it was their 1st or 2nd. No, it um, was their 1st. I just couldn't remember if it was a 1-2 that was in the race, but yeah, it was their 1st in the team's history. Yeah, so fantastic result for Aprilia. Um, they're on top of the world at the moment, especially if we have Pekka Benyaya not being 100% fit yeah. and Anaya Bastianini being out. They could rack up um, a few more wins easily. They could rack up a few more wins. Uh, I don't they're, I don't think they're in the championship fight this year, uh, but it would be nice to see them do incredibly well and maybe make the factory team sweat so a little bit. Why don't we save F2 for our automotive episode? We can do a quick cover of F2 and Super Cup. Mm -hmm. um, do you just want to jump into F1? We got about 15 minutes left. We can absolutely jump into Formula One. So this past weekend, we had Formula One at Monza, which is the a track that Temple I'm, of speed. I'm assuming Nick is a fan of, uh, given by the look on his face and the fact that it's Monza. And you're so, legally obligated to like Monza. You want to know what I'm jealous of? Um, My Camaro. My, as if. My father-in-law okay. in 2019 mm -hmm. at Monza for Charles Leclerc's victory. That had to be something. Yeah. That had to be something else. And, and he was there for work. And I'm like, oh, I want a work trip to take <laughs> Um, So I'm going to run through our qualifying real quick because yep. there are some talking points that we do need to talk about. Like we're Lance start Stroll off, being dead last. And we're going to talk about P20, Mr. Lance Stroll. Um, you know what's hilarious? I, I love his press conferences now. Because they're like, they're so Lawrence funny. Brennan, like that's uh, bad qualifying, tough, you know, tough Mike. Uh, what, what are you looking to? What, what do you need to get more out of the car? And he's like, we just need to be faster. And he goes, anything in particular? That he's like, I we just, I just need to be faster. <laughs> be like, better. That's it. But, but you can see Lance Stroll literally wanting to say like, what, the, 
what do you want me to say? Like, you just need to be better. Like, better, yeah. faster, more speed, power. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> whatever whatever the segments are that you want me to talk about, all of those. More of it, just yes. All of them. Um, so, horrible qualifying for Lance Stroll, starting dead last P20. Um, someone who's having a horrible Formula 1 season, Kevin Magnussen, down in 19th. Um, Esteban Ocon, down in 18th, and Pierre Gasly in 17th. Um not a good weekend for the Alpine Three duo times. after a I, stellar weekend last weekend. I dry clean and wear a tux every time Alpine has a DNF and a shitty qualifying. <laughs> Let's just say I've been wearing a tux a lot. <laughs> Alpine's <laughs> downfall is the most sadistic pleasure I've ever had in my life, and I love it. Anyway, she'll go on you for the Alfa Romeo with... A stellar livery. Literally. The the best livery. This livery this weekend reignited Shelby wanting an alpha. And she was like, I, I want to put it in that livery. Let's get a black or a white one. And I'll put it in that livery. I was like, I'm yeah, good. I'm game. Perfect. Go for it's it. It's a fantastic livery. Looked so good. Gorgeous. However, looking good does not mean that you are good. And Zhou Guan Yu was down in 16th. Yeah. Logan Sargent doing it for America. America. P15. Hmm. Another Q2 appearance God, for the America. boy. Uh, Valtteri Botas up in 14th with that fantastic livery. Nico Hulkenberg really outshining his teammate this year in 13th in qualifying. Um, but really, in my opinion, the star, the second brightest star of qualifying was one Liam Lawson, um, who put an Alphatari in ben. his first full Formula One weekend ben. in 12th. Yes. Daniel Ricciardo is shafted. His career is over. Oh, absolutely. Guaranteed. Yeah. No chance. So, Here's the thing. Daniel Ricciardo might come back whenever he's right, better. Right, but it's going to be a worse result. And they're going to say, you know what? On second thought, no. <laughs> that younger guy who's like he's way younger also... and doing doing better. Same flag. Yeah. We're going to, we're just going to put him in the car. Um, so I would not be surprised if uh, we do not hear that Daniel Ricciardo is getting a seat next year. And we do hear that Liam Lawson is in I that Alpha love... seat. I would love either Liam Lawson or Danny Rick partnering with Alonzo because Alonzo could train Liam Lawson to be, you know, you know, give be that experience that he needs. Mm -hmm. But then Danny Rick and Alonzo on the same team. Could you imagine? That would be something like, that would, it won't be good. Be a heck of a duo. It won't be good because Danny Rick is not that good. anymore. It's, it's kind of washed. The memes. Oh. Alonzo gardening and Danny Rick, like pissing the on the plants. The most beamable team, for sure, would be Ooh, Alonzo and Ricardo on the same now. thing. Lawrence, um, Lawrence, please make it happen. Uh, too much smiles going on in that garage, though. There'd be a, a lot of teeth. A lot no, of smiles going on in I that garage. I love it. I love teeth. <laughs> um, but Liam Lawson, fantastic qualifying result. Putting it P12 for his first full weekend. Um, really adapting to the car. Uh, Yuki Tsunoda P11, which is fantastic. It's exactly where he should be, um, given Yuki Tsunoda being, or Liam Lawson being 12th. Fernando Alonso. B10. Nick, the heck. Mercedes Power. Ah, fair enough. Anyway, Lando Norris, P9. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. Uh, Lando Norris, P9. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, P8. Oscar Piastri in 7th. Alex Albon outdriving that Williams by a long shot in P6. Yeah. Uh, Sergio Perez in 5th, which is all right for Sergio Perez, but still P5. He didn't uh, crash. Didn't crash, was in Q3. Helmet Marco, what do you want? As far so as I Sergio think Perez, this is a win. <laughs> this is a win. <laughs> Sergio Perez, P5. George Russell, P4, uh, substantially out qualifying his teammate. Charles Leclerc, P3. Max Verstappen, P2. We don't get to say that often, so Max Verstappen, P2. Um, and then Carlos signs the man of the P2 weekend. He's a smooth up, but it putting it on pole position. Um, yeah. Wow. I thought qualifying was actually fantastic. They used the new qualifying format once again um, with the mandatory hards, mediums, and softs for each respective qualifying session. Always results in an interesting qualifying. And then we get stuff like a Carlos Sainz poll, which is fantastic. Um, pretty much what I read in press conferences and that sort of thing um, is that Ferrari basically brought a different car to Monza. Uh, they As basically threw away the rest of the season for the sake of Monza. Um, they went to Giuseppe, who lives down the street in Monna, and they were like, hey, Giuseppe, let me have a Dakar. And he was like, hey. And, and you know what? It worked. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Carlos Sainz, P1 in qualifying. I'm going to run through our race results real quick, and then we can talk about it. Yuki Sonoda, P20, Esteban Ocon in 19th. Both and, of those DNFs. How did Yuki Sonoda finish P20? Go ahead and... 
enlighten uh-huh. the crowd. Yuki Sonoda finished P20, if you didn't see, because Yuki Sonoda did not start P20. I um, sat there, literally when that happened, I turned to Shelby, I was like, Honda Power Plants. Dude, I, I was so stoked. Really- okay, so that was the thing, is I saw that, and I made, so for starters, by the way, I was watching the race with the biggest Max Verstappen fan that I know. And when that happened, I looked at him, and he's like, don't say a word. And I was like, okay, I'll just sit here in silence and just giggle, and hopefully this happens. Um, but it did not. Anyway. It's okay, um, because Alonso's so, going to win in Singapore. Have you been seeing all the shit? He, know, he knows he knows something. He Which, knows things? You know what's funny? Fernando literally said, our team knows strategy and knows how to win at Singapore. And I literally sat there and was like, is Lance Stroll about to crash on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's... Is this how Fernando, like, we've done this. Lance, I was like, is this how Lance Stroll's going to be a tennis player? Like, am I having flashbacks? Lance Stroll's going to crash intentionally, get an FIA ban, and then... <laughs> oh my gosh. Honestly, um, I would not complain. And if people go, oh my god, you're cheating, I'd be like, suck it. That's Lance Stroll, no one cares. That's why. <laughs> So, Yuki Sonoda and Esteban Ocon, DNFs. Kevin Magnuson, P18. Nico Hulkenberg, P17. That Haas is garbage. Trash. Um, (laughs) Lance Stroll, moving up the order, P20, the P16. Congratulations. Um, Pierre Gasly down in P15, a miserable result given his podium last weekend. Uh, Zhou Guan Yu in 14th, moving up a couple spots. Logan Sargent, moving up the ranks into P13. Oscar Piastri was down in 12th. Uh, Liam Lawson, moving up a spot into P11. Well done, Liam Lawson. He held off traffic. Um, This was an actual normal Formula One race for once for Liam Lawson. This is very nice to see that he can hold his own and he can manage traffic and strategy and that sort of thing. So well done to Liam Lawson, P11. See you on the grid next year. Valtteri Bottas was P10. Fernando Alonso was in 9th. Lando Norris moved up to 8th. 8th, Alex Albon was down in 7th. Pretty solid result, considering he's in Williamson, started 6th. Yeah. Uh, Lewis Hamilton in P6. We'll get to him in a minute. Uh, George Russell was in 5th. Charles Leclerc was down in 4th, but just narrowly, Carlos Sainz in 3rd. Sergio Perez, P2. And Max Verstappen for the 10th consecutive race in a row, P1. Setting a new all-time record, breaking Sebastian Vettel's record from 2013 i believe it was Mm -hmm. of nine race victories uh no one thought that would ever be broken and here we are with 10 and who knows on this trajectory max verstappen could go on to win 18 races in a row which is what it would be if he wins the rest of the season um, which is terrifying let's quickly in the last 10 minutes touch on a couple of the high points of this race uh because if you watched it and just want some thoughts First of all, what the hell, Mercedes Lewis Hamilton? Um, Let me rewind. Quote of the season. George, we need more management in turn five and turn six. I don't know if you can tell, but I have someone so far up my ass right now. That was hilarious. It's the best quote. It is for sure the radio message of the season. I saw saw a meme, and it was like uh, George's ass right now and it was an x-ray of a skeleton it was an x-ray and there was a red bull yeah fantastic i love the internet for that reason peak formula one content um no yeah then lewis hamilton doing stupid shit causing penalties somehow his car is made of nokia phones um toto makes no sense toto being the saltiest teenage girl (laughs) when Uh, the mercedes comments have been brutal so i i saw a fantastic meme and it was uh, Mercedes when they're breaking all the records and dominating the sport for nearly a decade and it was like a sped up scene from the Wolf of Wall Street where a bunch of guys were talking and high fiving and like all that stuff and then it was like Mercedes when anybody else does what they did and it sh- it's just Walter White staring and it's like a slow zoom <laughs> it's so if you haven't heard Toto's like oh, I don't really give a shit about the records because that shit's for Wikipedia nobody cares anyway yeah you know what else is for Wikipedia most wins most championships, uh, consecutive constructors champions. Sports, sports, sports are for the internet. By the way, Wikipedia. Like that's the, why, that's why Wikipedia exists. Like, no offense, Toto. If it wasn't for Wikipedia records, you wouldn't be a billionaire. Thoughts, F- facts. If facts. Mercedes wasn't successful, you wouldn't be making money on the team. So actually, True. records are important. And what people were saying on Twitter is Toto is only jealous because Mercedes as a team, could not win as many consecutive races as Max has won. 
uh, by himself. True. So yes. there's an interesting comment because somebody was like, you, so Mercedes has come out and Toto's like, yeah, well, Lewis always had to battle with his teammates. And right, blah, 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 right. Blah. Tough teammates, and blah, blah, people blah. are like, you're conveniently forgetting when Valtteri was told to abort a fastest lap so that Lewis could get the one point over Valtteri. And that was four years compared to the two years of Nico and Lewis. So let's not get it twisted, folks. Right. All our, all our uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Georgie Blomwell dash LH44 still we rise Lewis forever he's a knight on Twitter for those of y'all let's not get it twisted Valtteri was so much more of a pushover than Checo was true let's just like let's just cut the bullshit all right so that but someone commented they're like people are are it was like hey Toto if Lewis's teammates were so much better than Checo is why is Max winning more than both Mercedes drivers combined? Yeah. Explain that one to me. He's only salty because they thought 2022 was an off year. And given given that season, they'd be able to write the course and, and, and steady yep. the ship and, and somehow get it turned around. When Mercedes no. are like, shit, maybe we're not as smart as we thought we were. Now they're right. It's how <laughs> we don't have the engineers to design the next generation Panzer and take it to the Austrians. Ah, it's, we it's, got one set of regulations really right. That's yeah, it. Well, and, and so the funny thing is, is I'm sitting here and I'm like, Toto's Austrian and he's getting beating, getting beaten by an Austrian team. Like, it's it, kind of funny. It's, he, he's a child and I hate him. And anybody thinks it's the same thing. Toto's like, checo has been saying the cause shit. And then it's like, at the end of the day, Fix your damn car. It's not yeah. our problem. Like, who, yeah. oh no, oh no, our car shit. We're dominating the season. We're dominating <laughs> the sport. Fix your shit. Done with F1. And the only reason I'm still watching it is because of Fernando. And I quite literally have never watched, for our listeners, I have never watched more variety and quantity of motorsports in my life than I do right now. I am up at 8 a.m. and I am watching racing till 8 p.m. non-stop yep. it is formula one it's super gt it's porsche super cup it's nascar it's i don't even know if i already said indy car but indy car I'll, I'll watch formula one what world endurance championship IMSA. like there's so much michelin pilot sport challenge i am watching f1 because i am in love with fernando but when he retires i'm not kidding you ben i don't know if i'll watch it every weekend like something will dramatically have to change because I, is it worth my two hours to watch that when I could go watch two Porsche Super Cup races for two hours and have better racing? This is why I just didn't pick a favorite driver or a favorite team. I didn't pick you it. Just, he you picked just, me. You're just, that's not how that works. Anyway. Um, Padre pulled me out from the crowd and said, here, young one, you will be mine. Congratulations to Max Verstappen on his new record. Or something. Uh, by the way, at the, at the, I'm actually kind of rooting for Verstappen for the rest of the season now. I just want to see how well this far this record goes um no so at the start of the next grand prix it will be 308 days since red bull lost a grand prix um so i i think this record is truly outstanding um, i think, I think this will be gonna win in singapore um i think i'm gonna get rid of nick for most of this podcast well, wait, um wait. last episode you were like hey remember the monza curse and what did i say i predicted it i said max is going to be the one that bitch slaps the monza curse yeah because he I'm sacrificed yuki sonoda now i'm predicting that alonzo is going to win singapore and i don't give a shit if it's crash gate again it will happen somehow <laughs> stay tuned um nick patty any more thoughts on formula one before we end off this episode on an italian note i can smell with my nimble knows that my wife is making homemade pasta so i think this is a perfect time to end well that is going to be the perfect time to end episode 72 of the clutch dump if you've made it this far thank you so much for listening or for watching uh like nick said at the top of the show make sure you go follow us on social media at the clutch dump follow us on youtube at the clutch dump 
pod. Make sure you subscribe, uh, like, and share the video. Comment down below whether you think Honda or Toyota is better. By the way, the only correct answer is Honda. Um, and of course, on all the audio platforms, make sure you follow or subscribe. Leave a rating and a review if you can. Stay tuned for episode 73 where we discuss things such as the new Mercedes AMG GT, several resto mods, several concept cars, um, and have another edition of Two Car Garage. Until then, that's going to do it from us here at the Clutch Dump. We will see you next time. Mm-hmm.